welcome to Bible Mind tonight. This is going to be a going to be a good one tonight. So we're going to have opportunity to uh, to discuss. And uh, so there's a, a a thread that we've continued through this that we try to to maintain, even though you know we talk about people, places, and things, and, and what's happening happening in the church uh, as Pentecostals as uh, believers in that that the uh, uh, power and working with the Holy Spirit did not cease. We want to take a look at that, and we want to see God's hand at work through time. You know, there wasn't this big skip. You know, where where some people may think, well, you know, it was in the first century church, and then boom, all of a sudden, 1900, it just popped up again. No, you know, the Holy Spirit has been at work all through time, and uh, so we're going to look at some of this today, kind of catch up on some of those threads if you will. Uh, we've been, uh, if you need to catch up on some of the other parts that we've continued this thread, the ones to look for on either YouTube or Facebook would be number 8 and number 20, and this is episode 44, so 8, 20, and 44 would be the ones to uh, catch up on, on the Pentecostal thread and where we talked about those things. Uh, so both of these videos, 8 and 20, they offer ample evidence that the manifestations and gifts of the Spirit, including speaking in tongues, did not cease after the apostles, but they continued long after that way through time. As the uh, mainstream Catholic Church became increasingly political after the rise of Constantine, you know, when the you know, Christianity was declared the norm, you know, the, the state religion, then you saw kind of a marriage over time, and we've studied this out, of church and state to where, you know, politics was intermingled with the church. And you see a moving away from a church relying on the power and giftings of the Holy Spirit because they had influence in other ways, and that became a substitute. Uh, so we saw uh, when... Uh, uh, Pentecostal movement would grow in pockets of people, the church would feel threatened by that and they would label them as heretics and then some you know, later, uh, kind of in this age that we're in right now, they would even start persecuting these other believers that, that believed in the power and giftings of the Holy Spirit and, and uh, would, would do all manner of things against them. We saw uh, Peter Waldo a couple of weeks ago, we talked about when the Waldensians uh, even disagreeing with some of the extra biblical teachings of the church, like purgatory and indulgences and things like that, if you just talk about those in a negative way, you could even face a uh, penalty of death uh, for, the, for uh, believing in that. So. This is uh, what the mainline church had evolved to, a spiritual, spiritually powerless political entity who wielded its power authoritatively and following Jesus was relegated to ritual and religious practice. And so from time to time you see people that would rise up and say, I think following Jesus needs to be more than just a religious practice. You know, we need, we need more of an experience uh, in walking with Christ, and, and so therein lie the struggle. So let's talk about the, the Middle Ages. The 10th to 16th centuries was not dark to the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, as some want us to believe. Most recording, uh, most recording of history took place at this time uh, by the Catholic Church. So naturally, a lot of things are going to be left out if it isn't part of their narrative. You understand what I'm saying? And so uh, the things that we do have record of are things that even they recognized as, you know, we can't just sweep this under the rug. Uh, we'll, we'll note these things. But it lets you know, it gives you windows into uh, these things saying there must have been other uh, examples going on. And so uh, here's some examples of some people who allowed the Holy Spirit to work through them in ways that are familiar to us. And, and you'll understand uh, in, in our context how we view this, although sometimes the writings of these things uh, make it sound a little different than it was, but we understand it in a different context, you know, having, uh, uh, you know, believing in the power of the Holy Spirit today. So, first of all, this is a, a guy by the name of Andrew the Fool for Christ, and he was in the, the middle of the 900s. I don't, I don't mind, I wouldn't mind the title, Keep the Fool for Christ, uh, but his name was Andrew Salas. And uh, he's known historically as Andrew of Constantinople or Andrew the Fool for Christ or sometimes just Andrew the Fool. That lacks a little more context. You know, I, like, I would like to have the of Christ uh, attached to that if it were me. 
uh, he was a, um, uh, a bodyguard in Constantinople and became known during uh, one of the sieges the, when the Muslims came and, and sieged Const Constantinople. He had a vision of angels encamped around uh, Constantinople, Constantinople pr um, protecting them. And so he shared this vision, you know, that he, this is what I saw. And the Muslim armies the next day left and, and melted away. And so, you know, it's like, hey, you know, Andrew, you know, he saw this. And, and so after that experience, he decided he didn't really like the way that he was living. He wanted to have a, a more simple, devoted life to Christ. And uh, so he basically sold everything, uh, lived homeless in the street, he said, you know, I'm not storing up any treasures. He went completely the other way. You know, I'm not storing up any treasures on earth. And uh, most of the pictures that uh, I could even find of him, you know, he, he just has, you know, just something wrapped around him. I mean, it looked like he didn't even own any clothes. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't after fashion trend or anything. He's like, I'm just giving it all up. And uh, so he lived, he lived just a simple, devoted life to the Lord. And uh, he demonstrated several gifts of the Spirit that uh, during his life. He had uh, the spiritual ability to see inside people's lives and name their secret sins. You would not want him for a friend. <laughs> and uh, so, so he, you know, he could. And what do we call that? Word of knowledge. And so uh, he had this ability, and, and uh, he is also reported to have supernatural ability to speak to each person about their innermost secrets in their native tongue. And so he could walk up to someone that that you know didn't speak his language, and he could tell them about their innermost struggles in their native language, which is speaking in tongues. So uh, Andrew is largely ignored by the Western church, but he's held as a saint in Eastern tradition, so therefore uh, the halo. Simeon the theologian. He's uh, toward the, the end of the 900s, early 1000s, and uh, he was a monk in the East and writes of his intimate experiences with God. He believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit being a sub work to salvation uh, and from baptism in water with a main emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit to transform. He describes this event as, and you'll recognize this phrase, seeing the light. You know, we have a song that says something like, how's the song go? I saw the light, right. And so, uh, but he believed that, that this, this uh, experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit, he said, was, was equivalent to seeing the light. And he felt emotionally and physically uh, that, that this uh, experience would emotionally and physically transform the soul with its divine power. Simeon believed that Christianity had descended into ritual, which for many people replaced the early emphasis on actual and direct experiences of God. He had strong, strong conviction that the life of a Christian must uh, much more than mere observance of rules must include personal experiences and the presence of the living Christ. And we would feel that way as well. It's not, it's not about going and performing a ritual or, you know, we're not very ritual. In some ways we are. Uh, you know, we have things that we do, right? But, uh, but, but we believe that there's more to living a Christian life than just performing some rituals. It's about our experience in living with Christ. Simeon's teachings, especially those regarding the direct experience of God's grace, brought accusations of heresy and eventual exile. And so, uh, again, the church demonstrated that anybody that tried to, uh, you know, return to some of the, the experiences of the first church or whatever, they would, they would uh, meet that harshly. Simeon wrote extensively about his experiences with God and the Holy Spirit, and uh, so to the skeptic that believed that, you know, this was a bunch of nonsense that he was writing about, he wrote this. It says, do not say that it is impossible to receive the Spirit of God. On the contrary, it is entirely possible when one desires it. Uh, in another play, in, in a writing called the uh, Catechesis 22, he says, let us be like those who knock patiently and to whom the Lord opens the door of his kingdom according to his promise. And like those who seek and are given the Holy Spirit, it is possible for a man who seeks with all his soul not to find the Holy Spirit and be enriched by his uh, charismata. So he is saying, if you seek the Holy Spirit, you'll find it. You're not going to find it if 
You're not interested. And so uh, that was kind of his take on it. Next we have Hildegard of Bingen. Uh, Hildegard was born to a noble family in Mainz, Germany in uh, the year that Urban II decla uh, declared war for the First Crusade. So when we were talking about that. So that was the, the year that she was born. She was the youngest of ten children. And what does the word tithe mean? Yeah. A tenth, right? And so her parents had ten children, so guess what they did? They, they tithed Hildegard <laughs> to a convent. And so, wow. Wow. Uh, but that, that's she what she did. <laughs> and so then there were nine. Uh, but uh, Hildegard uh, became an abbess uh, in, in this uh, uh, convent that she was donated to. And uh, Hildegard, she would have uh, visions, just, just visions over and over again. She would have these j just vision experiences. And she didn't really know what to make of it. You know, she sometimes wondered if she was crazy or whatever. But she had, she had all these visions that she would have. And... Um, Hildegard received a remarkable vision by the time she was 42. Uh, she wrote later, A fiery light flashing intensely came from the open vault of heaven and poured through my whole brain like a flame that is hot without burning. It kindled all my heart and all my breasts, and suddenly I could, I could understand. And so she had this experience where, where finally, and, you know, she didn't, put any terms to what this experience was, but this experience that she had, all of a sudden her understanding was opened up and she made sense out of the dreams and the visions that, that she had been having. Uh, her ministry really exploded after that in addition to recording uh, her visions and their interpretations in books. Hildegard wrote book, uh, works on medicine and natural science and she, co uh, she composed music and plays and, and just wrote a lot of things. Uh, she had intense visions which she delivered publicly as prophecy, and uh, several miracles were even attributed to her. She's reputed to have spoken in tongues and also is said to sing concerts in the spirit and to write entire books in unknown languages or unlearned languages. Um, in spite of her harsh denunciations, Hildegard believed that her new song must float like a feather on the breath of God. So she wasn't uh, in, no, in any way trying to hold it back or you know keep the experience to herself but she would proclaim that uh, and so um, even though uh, Blair, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux you remember him and uh, the Pope at the time Eugenius III they recognized her uh, spiritual authenticity you know they, they weren't harsh to her but other spiritual leaders uh, were very unaccepting of uh, the, the, the things that she would experience and, and prophesy and teach. During her last year, her superiors, unhappy with her opposition to local church policies, placed her community, like the whole, the whole abbey, under interdict. Does anybody remember what interdict is? It's basically when the church says, you can no longer partake of the Eucharist. And so that you know, puts them in a state of, well, you know, if I can't partake of the body of Christ, then I'm out of fellowship with God. And so uh, even though that's a false teaching, that, that's uh, a power that they wielded. You know, you don't, uh, you know, play the game that we lay out, then we're going to deny your salvation. And uh, so uh, they did this for six months, and during that time, she and her daughters uh, were denied even music, you know, the Eucharist and, and music as well. Uh, there are writings to suggest that many of the Waldensian movement, if you remember we talked about Peter Waldo and I mentioned him earlier, uh, that many in this movement uh, spoke in tongues. And uh, even followers of Francis Assisi that we talked about. And this is one of those guys, Anthony of Padua. He was a follower of Francis and a Franciscan monk. He addressed a council once uh, with the attendee, attendees to this council from all over the place and there were many languages represented. And so Anthony gets up and he speaks and he addresses the crowd and they all heard him speak in their own languages. Okay? So this brings up a, a point that uh, we've not talked much about. I know I've mentioned it a couple of times, but there was a lot written by a lot of the church fathers that have, that have uh, written extensively and those that have uh, written on tongues and especially trying to, if you want to call it, analyze what happened on the day of Pentecost. 
And there was an argument between, is it a miracle of speech or is it a miracle of hearing? So those that would argue that it's a miracle of speech would say they literally spoke those languages. You know what I'm saying? The, those that would argue that it's a miracle of hearing, they say regardless of what they were saying, the, the miracle was in the hearing. The people heard the, in, in their own language. And so this would definitely be what this was a miracle of with Anthony, that as he spoke, he only spoke and I don't know what language he spoke, but as he spoke, everyone heard in their own languages. Dominic, Dominic is the founder of the Dominican order that we talked about. And anybody remember who uh, uh, joined the Dominican order against his parents' wishes? It rhymes with Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, it's Thomas. Good. How'd you know? Uh, so this is that Dominic that was actually the founder of that order, and um, uh, it's reported to uh, he's reported to have demonstrated the gift of tongues when he spoke fluently in German to some people that have been very kind to him in in a certain situation in this story. Uh, but these these people were very hospitable uh, hospitable to him, and he wanted to repay them by uh, sharing the gospel with them, but he didn't speak German and that's all they spoke. And so he started trying to, to uh, you know, share the gospel with them and all of a sudden he was speaking fluent German to them and, and ministered to them in German. So uh, that was the, the miracle from Dominic. In the 1300s, and I'm not going to talk about much about this now because we're going to save this for a conversation later, but there's a group called the Moravians uh, started by a guy by the name of John Huss and uh, later another uh, notable person in uh, in this story as it unfolds. And the Moravians, by the way, still exist today. Uh, there was a Count Zinzendorf. Anybody heard of him? Yes. Okay. And so we're going to we're going to talk about that later. But uh, the the uh, 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 those that are critical or the detractors of the Moravians, uh, part of their argument about them and saying that they were uh, it was a heresy was because, you know, these crazy people spoke in tongues. And so we know that the Moravians uh, still had, you know, had the manifestations of the Spirit. We're going to talk a, little, a lot more about them uh, in coming weeks. Gregory Palamas, he was uh, an ascetic monk in the East who was a prolific writer. Uh, and, and there's a lot of story to tell about him, so I'm not going to go into it all. Uh, but, you know, you're welcome to go look it up for yourself. But it's very controversial. He was in and out of, you know, any anybody that uh, takes a stand against the church, you know, they get in trouble. And so he was kind of up and down in, in and out of the church. And he ended up uh, as the Archbishop of Thessalonica. He emphasized the laying on of hands for reception of the gifts of healing, miracles, foreknowledge, uh, irrefutable wisdom, diverse tongues, and interpretation of tongues. In uh, his writing, he has a writing called The Triads. He speaks of tongues being a gift that is possible. And so uh, this, is, this is part of his, his beliefs and his writing during his time. Another one, his name is Thomas Munzer. Uh, you may even say Tomas, if you will. Uh, anyway, he was a radical German reformer who uh, provoked uh, detestation uh, and admiration in almost equal amount. So it's like, you know, people really hated him and they really loved him, both. Uh, he stood up against not only the Catholic Church, but against Martin Luther. So he was, he was like, you know, he was like the reformer outside of the reformer. And uh, really, um, you know, the, the Catholic Church didn't like him and the reformers didn't like him either. And it wound up getting him beheaded when he was 35 years old. Uh, Munzer taught that the baptism of the Holy Spirit... Uh, direct revelation in visions and dreams, Holy Spirit possession and guidance, as well as radical social reforms and the imminent return of Christ. And so, you know, it sounds sounds very Pentecostal, right? Uh, but he was uh, he was not in a time that was very accepting of that, and it, it got him in trouble. Ignatius of Loyola, um, and he was in the the 1400s to 1500s, and uh, he founded a society called the Society of Jesus. Does anybody know the more common name of the Society of Jesus? It's the Jesuits. You heard of the Jesuits. 
So this uh, uh, Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Society of uh, Jesus, which is called the Jesuits, he is known to have often sung in the spirit. Uh, I read an article published by the Jesuits who said, and if any Christian has ever been baptized in the spirit, Ignatius was. And uh, it compared many of his characteristics as being similar to in terms of what we would consider Pentecostals today. And that's how he lived his life. The last person that I wanted to mention, Francis Xavier, uh, in the 1500s, he traveled to many countries uh, preaching the gospel, even as far as Japan. And he really struggled with learning other lang languages. And, uh, you know, most of us are, uh, you know, have no concept of how hard it is for a missionary to go into another country. And anybody in here speak a second language? Nobody? Uh, Swahili, okay. All right, not fl oh, two words. Two words. <laughs> All right, you know, uh, I know I know a little Spanish, but not enough to carry on a conversation. Uh, you know, if I hear somebody speaking in Spanish, I, I can pick up like maybe one word a sentence or something that's not enough to go on. But you know, I'd have to bring my friend David along with me to. Uh, you didn't raise your hand. You know two languages. <laughs> Being bashful. Uh, and so, you know, this is a problem. And so Francis Xavier really struggled with going to other, and, and he considered uh, Japanese really hard for him to understand. And he never uh, claimed it or wrote it about himself, but uh, there's testimonies by others that traveled with him that heard Francis uh, preaching in other languages that he had not learned. And uh, these testimonies were weaponized uh, really by the Reformation against the Catholic Church, saying, hey, we know, we know some Catholics that, that speak in tongues, and so therefore y'all are of the devil. And so, you know, that, they kind of weaponized that against them. And so uh, thought that it was an example that the Catholic Church had lost their way. Now, maybe they had indeed lost their way, but it wasn't because Francis Xavier spoke in tongues, for sure. Okay, so that's just kind of a snapshot of uh, the existence of uh, people that demonstrated the gifts of the Spirit throughout what we would call maybe the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. And we didn't go deep into their stories, but we wanted to use this to pivot into some of the topics that it brings up. Tongues of men and of angels. Much has been written, like I said earlier, about speaking in tongues being uh, by, by notable author, authors throughout church history. And some dive into the controversy of whether uh, tongues mentioned in scripture were the miracle of hearing or speech, like we talked about just a little bit ago. But most of the writers throughout the age of the church, when they spoke about speaking in tongues or, or weighed in on it, really spoke of it in context of it being the languages of men. And so... When we read in 1 Corinthians 13, we read, read that phrase. And by the way, 1 Corinthians 13, we call it the love chapter, love chapter because it is talking about love being higher than, than other gifts. But it's sandwiched right in the middle. It's really positioned as part of 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. So really it's a set. It's not, it's not just like a, a break. We're taking a break and talking about love. It's part of the gifts of the Spirit that's 12 through 14. And so this is where we get the phrase, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. That's how he starts 13. So what did Paul mean? And tongues just means what? And so literally it means languages. And, and so that's why even some uh, Bible translations, it doesn't use the word tongues. It uses the word languages in their translation because that's basically what it means. And so Paul was saying that uh, I speak with the languages of men and I speak with languages of angels. And in the context that we're familiar with, that we believe that to be uh, a, a language that, that is uh, prompted by the Holy Spirit that isn't a language of men or language known language of earth. Uh, so let's talk about the tongues of men just for a second. On the day of Pentecost, they spoke in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. And these were obviously, like you said, uh, languages of men because those that were outside of the group that was going on and you know uh, if you want to refer back to the video if you're watching this and, and go way back where we were talking about the day of Pentecost likely happened not in the upper room but on Solomon's porch where the people in the temple heard what was going on and they were hearing these disciples praise God in their own languages and so we know that that was tongues of men 
Uh, some have argued on the side of the 120 actually miraculously speaking in the languages, while others, like I said, uh, they believe that they spoke just whatever, and the people heard each in their own language. Acts 2.4 says, And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? So if you kind of look at it in that context, you know what I'm talking about, you can, you can see where they could get the argument that maybe it was a miracle of hearing rather than a miracle of speech, or maybe it was both. If 120 people were praising God in all languages, it would be a little bit hard to discern, wouldn't it? I really believe there was probably some of both. You know, there, were, there was a lot of miracle going on at the time. There was the miracle of, of them speaking a language they didn't know, and there was the language of hearing in, you know, a large context and, and being able to hone in on their language so that they would be, realize that it was, uh, it was a miracle of God. Uh, some of the stories above that we talked about were clearly languages of men. You know, like speaking in German and, and you know, these, these different things. These were, these were languages of men that were being spoke. I've heard many personal testimonies from missionaries that, uh, you know, went into an area. And, and one particular uh, incident, incident that I remember, I don't remember his name at, at the time, but, but he, was, he had got into a bit of trouble. You know, these people had come around and, and they were meaning harm to him. And he didn't know their language, and they were just shouting at him or, or, or whatever, you know, and he didn't know what they were saying, they didn't know what he was saying, and, and all of a sudden he started speaking in their language. And that, the long story is that they, uh, they eventually accepted Christ because they realized that there was something miraculous going on there. Uh, when Peter went to Cornelius' house and preached, those gathered were filled with the Holy Spirit as he was preaching. In Acts 10, 46, it says... For they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Just as we have would uh, lead you to believe that these were also the tongues of men because that's the experience that Peter was immediately drawing on. You know, they started speaking in tongues. You, you have to think, okay, what uh, indication was it that they were speaking in tongues? You see what I'm saying? Because more than likely everybody there were Greek speaking. Uh, Peter may have been, you know, he may have understood and, and been able to speak Hebrew, likely, maybe even Aramaic. Uh, but they were, for it to be recognized as they were speaking in tongues, it had to be something other than their language, their learned language, or the language or the uh, uh, text wouldn't have read they were speaking in tongues or, or other languages. So there had to be some other language that was unlearned for them, but it had to be something that the group that came with Peter understood to be different. You see what I'm saying? And so it could have been, it, it could have been either a, a miracle of speech or hearing, even in that application. Let's talk now about tongues of angels. There's a word, I don't know if you're familiar with it, called glossolalia, and uh, it's a term that was basically created to, uh, you know, for people that uh, wanted to put a scientific term on it or whatever, but it's a Greek word that literally means, uh, glossa means tongue, and uh, lalia or lalia means talking, so tongue talking is what that word means, literally. Glossolalia can actually be found in, in other religions, Hindu and some other, other religions, and this will be used as an argument sometimes against Pentecostals, saying that, hey, you know, you're, you're doing things that, that are found in other religions, so it can't be of God. How many of that the devil uh, has a counterfeit yeah, to to just about everything. You know, he tries to he tries to rob, he tries to steal, he tries to uh, you know copy things that that God does uh, in in another context to lead people away from God. Uh, op opponents will argue that it's not biblical and that biblical tongues are only languages of men and that glossolalia is anywhere from misguided to even of the devil. But what does the Bible say? And that's what concerns us. That's what we are interested most in is what the Bible says, not what does man say. So Romans 8, 26 and 27, it says, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. 
And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Uh, sometimes the words of earthly languages just can't express what we need to pray to God. And, and we understand that. We understand that our speech is limited, our thought is limited, but when we pray in the Spirit, and, and I know that, that some would say, you know, well, you know, it's a little stretch to say groanings is praying in spirit or groanings is even a, a heavenly language or something like that. But in the context that we know, in the, uh, the context that we've experienced, we know that this is, this is a time when uh, the Holy Spirit will take over and, and pray through us and pray for us in, in accordance with God's will. Because sometimes we don't know what we need to pray for as we ought, as the scripture says. When looking at 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, we find uh, a term called various tongues mentioned. In uh, chapter 12, verse 10, it says, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. If uh, tongues' only purpose was to communicate to other people in missionary settings, would there need to be a gift of interpretation? No. Because if I, was, if I was just speaking to you in your language, then... I'm speaking in your language, right? And so there wouldn't need to be interpretation of that. Um, and so Paul follows with uh, uh, mentioning two kinds of tongues in chapter 13, men and of angels. And then when we get to chapter 14, Paul is clearly not talking about the tongues of men uh, in scriptures like 14.2. It says, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to yeah. men, but to God, and no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. So Paul is laying out here that there, there is a tongue of angels, not of men, and, and that, you know, you can debate what, you, what he means by angels. I'm, I'm not here to say it's literally the language of the angels, but Paul is just saying it's not earthly. It's, it's heavenly. It's, it's something outside of this world because it's not a known language of men. But God speaks through us. The Holy Spirit speaks through us uh, mysteries in the Spirit. And so he's instructing the church in Corinth that tongues has a place, uh, but that prophecy is better. And that's the purpose. You know, it, when you read 12 and, and 14, he's, uh, the, the Corinthian church has... Uh, Everybody's, you know, demonstrating their gifts in the spirit in such a way that the church is actually falling into chaos. And how do you know? How many of you know that the that God is not the author of confusion? So Paul is giving them some instruction in in helping them have their service in order so that it'll be a benefit to the body and and not confusing and and not a turnoff to people that that come in from outside so that it be a witness for them. So that's that's the context of what these these scriptures are for. It's not a it's not a a, a passage about cessation of these gifts, but it's a passage. If you do these things in order and let the Spirit direct this, then it's going to be a benefit to the body. And so in the context of the corporate gathering in the church, Paul is saying that, yeah, you know, speaking in tongues is fine, but prophecy is better because that, that prophecy is benefit to the entire church. If someone speaks in tongues in the corporate gathering, he says that it should what? Be followed, be followed by interpretation because therefore the body can be edified. Verse 6 through 11 uh, goes on. This is in chapter 14 still. He explains that uh, if, if uh, he came to them speaking in tongues, they wouldn't benefit because it wouldn't be understandable to them. And so he, he recognizes that when I come to the church, uh, it would be better for me to speak prophecy in a language that you understand. And so in verse 11, he recognizes that they are speaking in tongues because they are eager for the manifestations of the Spirit. So he encourages them to strive for the manifestations that will be beneficial to the entire body. And so he recognizes all that they're eager that, you know, we, we're eager for these gifts. You know, we want the, the gift of wisdom and the gift of knowledge and the gift of, of tongues and interpretation. And, you know, we want all of these things to be operating in the church. And uh, so he's saying, this is great. Your eagerness for this is great. But let's strive to do the things that are beneficial to the church in our corporate settings. Verse 13. It says, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? 
I will pray in my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise in my spirit with my spirit, but I will sing praise with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? For you may be given, giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak t in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, the church, uh, in the church, I would rather speak five words with my mind or in my understanding in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in, a, in another language or in a tongue. And so here Paul's just, he's laying out that in the corporate setting, with the purpose of building up the body, that it's better to prophesy, it's better to speak with understanding so that we can build up uh, that, that, uh, the body of Christ with one another. Uh, now, Paul declare, declares that he sometimes prays in the Spirit, right? A language that he doesn't understand. And then sometimes he prays with understanding. Sometimes he sings in the Spirit. Sometimes he sings uh, in words of un that he understands. Uh, when it comes to the church setting, he explains that it's better to speak these words of understanding. Then he quotes Isaiah 28:11. For by people of strange lips, some of your Bibles may say stammering lips, but strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to his people. So this really matches Paul's uh, phrase of speak with the tongues of men and angels, right? So here we have strange lips. That would be... Uh, 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 you know, that would match his language of angels, strength, you know, something foreign, something not of this world. And then foreign tongue, that would be other tongues of men. And so he's quoting, he's bringing Isaiah's prophecy into this, saying this is, this is Old Testament prophecy that is going on here. Uh, he makes the arg argument that if you speak in tongues of men to unbelievers, it will be a sign to them something miraculous has happened. So if... Uh, you know, David, you know I don't speak Spanish. I mean, I know a few words. I know casa, you know, I know taco, you know, some things like that. Bueno. Bueno casa. That would be good house, right? <laughs> but if I, was, if I was talking and then all of a sudden I looked at you and I gave you a word of the Lord and it was fluent Spanish, what would you think? That, that's God, because that old boy up there don't know no Spanish beyond, too much beyond enchilada. And so, so you would know that, that, and you would understand that because you understand Spanish. And so Paul is saying that if, if I speak in a, in, in a tongue to someone that in that situation, then that's going to be a sign to the unbeliever that that's miraculous. But then he follows that with saying, if someone comes in and everybody's speaking in tongues, he's going to just think you're crazy, yeah, that's right. right? Because it's not going to make any sense to him. And so uh, he's saying in that, in that setting, if someone is prophesying and they come through that door and, and uh, the, the, the person stands up and he said, there's somebody that came in that door that needs Jesus and, you know, they're, they're doing this and they're doing that, they're going to, like, they're going to think, how they know that? And that must be miraculous. Now, Paul ends this teaching on this subject uh, by giving some direction uh, about keeping things orderly and all that. I'm not going to dive into that. But in verse 39 through 40, it says, So, my brothers, earnestly, well, this implied in their sisters as well. Okay, so. <laughs> so, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. Paul's explanation, since he is writing to the whole church, is that the whole church speaks in tongues. When he's, when he's writing these things, he's not saying, now, this is going to be for you guys that speak in tongues. Now, he was speaking to the whole church. He was writing to the whole church because he was under the understanding that all the gifts had been poured out upon all the church. And uh, so if... Um, uh, the, the, the teaching would have fallen flat on those who it didn't apply to. Uh, like if, if I were to get up here tonight and uh, teach, a uh, teach a lesson on uh, a, a good golf swing. <laughs> First of all, those of you who play golf would realize I didn't know what I was talking about in the first place because I'm not that good. But a lot of you in here, you'd be like, 
well, this don't mean anything. I'm not going to get anything out of this. You know what I'm saying? So Paul was teaching to a congregation that all understood what he was saying because it applied to all of them. So let's pivot into this question. Who is it for? Who is the Holy Spirit for? Who is speaking in tongues for? Peter stated on the day of Pentecost, on Acts 2.39, it says, This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord your God, or our God. Uh, many have manipulated, or, or many have maintained that Peter was wrong. Like, you know, Peter said it was for all those who are far off and, and your, all your descendants. And, you know, I know Peter said that, but he didn't really mean it. He meant just until the, the apostles died off. That's what he meant. It wouldn't be in the scripture if he, it wasn't. And that's what we maintain. But, but that's what the argument is sometimes, that, that it ceased. But to say that it ceased, you would have to say that Peter was wrong. Now, we've established in those three sessions that now three... Uh, number 8, number uh, 20, and number 44. And I'm saying that again for if anybody's watching this, they can go back and, and catch up with those episodes, that the promised gifts of the Spirit never ceased. We've seen that all throughout time now, that it never ceased. Although the mainline church, uh, as it got more political and more absorbed in, in uh, ritual, they found less use for those things, sadly, I would say. And even to the point that they would start uh, coming against those who would practice these things. But even though we see that they did not cease. So is speaking in tongues for everyone or for just a few chosen ones? Again, I'll refer to Acts 2.39. And uh, I don't know, somebody put something in red up there. What does that say? It says, this promise is to all. So if you break it down, that's who the promise is to. It's not just, uh, you know, God, God doesn't pick and choose who he wants to, to bless uh, with, with great things, great gifts that he has for you. In Romans 2, 11, it says, for God shows no per partiality. His salvation is for Everybody. all. His gifts are for Everybody. all. Some zoom in on Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 12.30 where he says, do all speak with tongues? And if you read that, the entirety of that verse, he's, he's, uh, these are really rhetorical questions and the implied answer is what? Yes. The implied answer is no. Oh. Surprised you with that one. <laughs> do all speak in tongues? No. This follows, I should have put the whole thing up there, but this follows, are all apostles, are all evangelists, are all, do all uh, have gifts of knowledge, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, you know, it goes through all these. The implied answer is no. And so some will zoom in on that and say, well, okay, so see, Paul says everybody doesn't speak in tongues, so it's okay because Paul said that. So Paul asked the question in, in a rhetorical uh, way, expecting the answer to be no. And of course we know that, that every believer does not speak in tongues. There's, there's entire denominations that teach against speaking in tongues. But I know many good, God-fearing, godly people in those denominations that, that are great believers. And so this doesn't mean that, that you know, they're less saved. You know, there are people that, there are uh, at least one Pentecostal denomination that says if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. That's not what the scripture says. Right. You know, we, we want to believe the scripture. We don't want to make up our own, our own answers here. We want to we want to fall on the word of God. And so uh, so, uh, of course, the answer is no now. And, and the answer was no, even in Paul's day, that not all did speak in tongues. But what does Paul think about whether everyone should speak in tongues? In Acts, we see uh, uh, the apostles in their practice when, after their experience, and they were going out and they were they were preaching the gospel, and we see several instances, and you can find this in episode 8 if you go back to that, but the, all the immediate episode, uh, episodes, all the immediate incidents of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit after that, it described it in the same way, even though some of them doesn't expressly say they spoke in tongues, but the, the language that was used is identical to filled with the Spirit that was used on the day of Pentecost. And so we know all those times 
were the the evidence was the same in those instances as well. And so when uh, people would accept the Lord in other places, for example, when uh, Philip went up to Samaria and he started, you know, people were getting saved, people were getting healed, and uh, Peter and John found out about it. So they, hey, you know, we got to go up there and make sure these people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so they laid hands on them, and, and they uh, had the same demonstration of the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, just like happened, you know, it referred back just like we did. And so. Um, so that was the expectations of the, the apostles. When Paul went to Ephesus and he found some believers that it, it had accepted or that had been baptized, and he said, have you, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, nobody even told us. Yeah. And Paul was like, all right, who'd we send to Ephesus? And so he laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That was the expectation of the apostles as the subsequent work to salvation was, was this next work. That was their expectation. 1 Corinthians 14, 5, it says, Paul says, I want you all to speak in tongues. That's a, I learned this from Brother Ronnie. That, that word right there in the original Greek, all means. it means all. <laughs> it's pretty simple verse 23 of chapter 14 it goes on to say if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and this is where he's talking about you know if everybody if everybody's speaking in tongues the poor guy that comes in off the street is going to think y'all are crazy uh, but his expectation you see is that the whole church has this ability the whole church has this gifting that you know but if you all try to throw it all out all at once and, and be used in this gifting, that's not going to be in order and, and uh, decent and in order as, as he uh, referred to it. 1 Corinthians 12.4 says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now the following verses goes on to read that the Holy Spirit uh, will give one this gift and one that gift and one this gift and one that gift and, and so that breaks down. So some people get the impression because of that that the Holy Spirit uh, and I'm, there's even I'm just going to say it that I believe this is an error that uh, some, some preachers believe that well I have the gift of I have the gift of wisdom or some preacher will say I have the gift of interpretation. I'm going to tell it to you like this. It's not your gift. It's the Holy Spirit's gift. We are all given the gifts, but the Holy Spirit uses them as he wills. So we all have these gifts. We, we are all given these abilities, and, and what, what we use depends on two things. First of all, what you're yielded for, so uh, or yielded to, so it would be more accurate for that minister or whatever to say, I know how to yield to the gift of, of wisdom. We all have our comfort levels. That's our flesh, right? And so being used in the gifts of the Spirit has everything to do with being yielded to the Spirit. Uh, the more you learn how to be yielded to the Spirit, the more He will use you in that gift. And that's why some people, uh, you know, in s most churches, you have a handful of people that, that they're the ones that, if somebody's going to give a message in tongues, it's going to be them, and they're going to give the interpretation. You know why that is? Because that person is comfortable yielding to that gift. That person is comfortable in yielding to that gift. It's not because they own that gift and they own that gift. But that gift is given to all, and they've learned how to yield to those gifts. And that's why it's important for us all to strive to, to be yielded in all the gifts. Because you may be the person that's sent to, to rescue someone from the situation that they're in. They need that, the, the gift that the Holy Spirit wants. And if you're, if you're like, well, Holy Spirit, that's not my gift. <laughs> it's like, I gave it to you. What would you do with it? <laughs> The gift of tongues then isn't isn't filtered to 
individuals, God saying, you know, okay, I think I think I just want you to have this ability, and I think I want you to, and nobody else gets it. You know, that would be again God showing partiality. But His gifts are for all. And I'm not going to go through the the whole narrative again, uh, referring again to episode eight. But we talked about the the language filled with the Holy Spirit carries the implication implication of uh, speaking in tongues, the same as being baptized carries the implication in water by immersion. Okay, so every time we hear baptized, what do we think? Immersed. In water by immersion. And so the as you study it out, when the uh, writers of the New Testament are being filled with the Holy Spirit, they're talking about with the implication of the evidence of speaking in tongues. So these scriptures, Galatians 3.5, It says, uh, this is verses 5 and 14, I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Verse 14, so that we were all believers, uh, so that we who are uh, are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Here he was saying that we believers, all of us, can receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Somebody say amen. amen. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, my English teacher taught me that if there's no subject, if you have a sentence that says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, what is the implied subject? You. 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 It's the understood you, right? And so when Paul says, you be filled with the Holy Spirit, there was no qualifier on that, was it? It wasn't a... Well, you know, some of you, or a few of you, he said, you, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That God's promise is for all believers. It's not just, you know, picking and choose a a select few believers. So what is the purpose of speaking in tongues? Um, Oh, how was that? Sorry. It's about being yielded, as I was talking about a while ago, to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, James talks about how unruly the tongue is. And some people's like, you know, why, why would, you know, what's, what's the big deal about speaking in tongues anyway? Our life is about being yielded to the Lord. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if he's going to give you power to go out and speak, if he's going to go give you uh, power to be witnesses and, and be bold and, and give you the power to use the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you have to be yielded to him. And so James is talking about this, this little member that we have called our tongue, it's, it's the most unruly member we have. And, you know, we see all kind of offense that, that it takes place, all kind of, of uh, you know, uh, cursings that can come out of our mouth and, and all these things. Uh, the tongue can be a dangerous thing, and we can literally tear people down or we can build people up by our tongue. And so the Holy Spirit, uh, God has chosen that to be the thing that if I've got your tongue, <laughs> i got all of you. Right, because that... that how many of you know the tongue's the last thing to go? <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of people sitting in the pew of the church has, hasn't given God their tongue yet. All right, and so um, uh, so this this is uh, one reason why I believe is the why because God knows that if you will yield your tongue to Him, it's not just about speaking in languages you don't know, but as Pastor Chris said many times, it's also about speaking in a language you do know are not speaking a language at all sometimes, okay? And, and so that's when you, you, we yield our tongue to him, then that's an implication of complete and true, so, uh, complete surrender to the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is also a form of prayer. Uh, Paul says the one that speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. That's 1 Corinthians 14. Yeah, all those are up there, okay. 14.2. Uh, uh, he's clearly not speaking of earthly languages uh, that would... Uh, benefit as a witness to men, right? So he's speaking of heavenly languages here. Again, in 14.4, he says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. So this establishes that Paul means uh, what Paul means by praying in the spirit. Then the next verse, it says, I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with understanding. So Paul sometimes prays in languages he does know, whatever the languages those were, and sometimes the Holy Spirit takes over and prays like he talked about in Romans according to the will of God in groanings or in sounds that he doesn't understand. Uh, Ephesians 6, 8 says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. 
And so here again, this is our understood you. It doesn't say some of you or if you want to. It says pray in the spirit at all times on every, uh, every occasion. Jude, Jude 1.20 tells us to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so here we have, uh, I'll stop short of calling it a mandate, but a strong encouragement that the writers of the, the Gospels of the, of the uh, I'm sorry, the New Testament, the epistles are saying this is a benefit to you to pray in the Holy Spirit and it, it will do great things for you. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, we can sing and we can praise in the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 14, uh, 15 through 17, Paul talks about giving thanks or praise in the Spirit. And he even talks about singing in the Spirit. And uh, praying in tongues edifies and strengthens ourselves. We need opportunities for the Holy Spirit to build us up. Anybody ever just get weary in your spirit? Anybody ever just, like, you fought the fight and, and you need to go sit in the corner and have, have the, the manager squirt some water in your mouth and wipe your forehead down a little bit or whatever, you know? Uh, sometimes sometimes we, we just need building up. And so praying in the Spirit builds us up. 1 Corinthians 14.4 says, The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. Jude 1.20, the scripture from above, goes on to say, But you, beloved, building yourself up in, the, in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. And so when we pray in the Spirit, there's just something that happens as, as the Spirit is flowing through us that just gives you energy and, and builds you up. And you, you don't know what you're saying, but you know, there's that confidence that the Holy Spirit is, is praying through me. And, and I know that it's good, and I know God understands it. And I know that the Spirit is praying according to the will of God. And it, it builds you up, and it builds your faith. Why doesn't everyone receive? That, that's the question here. The baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues and uh, the ability to pray in the Spirit is available for everyone. It's, it's just laying out there. It's for everyone. 1 Corinthians 14.1, uh, Paul says, Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. There again is an understood you. Okay? Earnestly desire these spiritual gifts. Verse 39 of the same says, So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues. So Paul encourages all believers to, to use or to seek all the gifts. They're out there for all of us. They're, they're given. They're just laying out there. They've been given already. It's up to us to receive. If I put $1,000 up here in stacks and said, come get it, and you just, you know, just, just come on up and get it, I've done my part. I gave it, right? I, I just put it up. Maybe I set a couple of tables over here and just stacked them up. Y'all come get it. It's like Friday rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of you would come up and get it. I know Dylan would. You'd be, we'd have to hold you back from getting more than your share. Some of us would say, what's the catch? <laughs> what's that? Some of us would say, what's the catch? Well, some of you would say, what's the catch? You know, that you'd be hesitant, wondering, you know, I, uh, was I, am I really serious? You know, I know Keith's not rich, so if he, is it play money? If I put real money up here, some of you would just like, ah, um, I'm not falling for that. I'm, I'm, there, there's got to be a catch. Uh, a few might even say, ah, it's not really for me. I have everything I need. <laughs> I don't need $1,000. A handful might look at those that are running for the money and shouting and, and cheering about it and say, they're a bunch of lunatics. They're just crazy going after that money. Uh, the critic of the group would reason because he didn't already have the $1,000, there must be something wrong with having it. $1,000 is, I mean, it's a trick of the devil, and they may even look up scriptures to support rejecting $1,000 so they could post it on Facebook, <laughs> something like that. But they, at the end of the class, some of you would walk out with $1,000 Others of you would go home and post on Facebook how $1,000 wasn't for everyone or that $1,000 isn't really useful for today and all who had received the $1,000 were crazy lunatics. <laughs> I think you get where I'm going with the analogy. The gifts of the Spirit have been given. What are we, we going to be yielded to? What are we going to come up and say, Lord, I know that you wouldn't give anything that is going to harm me. You're only going to give good gifts that benefit me. And I know some of you have heard me tell this story before, but I like it, so I'm going to tell it again. Uh, me, and a, uh, me and my nephew, Asa, was sitting on a couch watching 
uh, who wants to be uh, who wants to be a superhero if you remember that show with Stan Lee and we were watching that and he had a bag of cookies and was eating those cookies you know and and uh, I was just watching the show and he said Uncle Keith you want a cookie now at the time I was running that was back when when I was doing a lot of running and I was trying to watch what I eat and you know I mean the older you get the more cookies start showing up right <laughs> So it's not, like, it's not that I don't like cookies, but I was trying to be disciplined. And so he said, Uncle Keith, you want a cookie? And I said, no, Asa, I don't want a cookie. He said, it's a cookie. What do I not get about a cookie? <laughs> and that, that has always stuck to, stuck with me that God has given gifts to us. He has given things to us. And, and you know, we start analyzing. We start saying, you know, that, well, I don't think that's for me. I don't know if I should do that. And God said, I, I gave you a gift. It's a gift for me. It's a gift to the Holy Spirit. It's going to help your life. It's going to bless other people. What don't you get? And we're thinking, oh, it might make me fat. <laughs> It, it might make me look crazy if I, if I eat this gift or if I, if I eat this cookie. But we treat the gifts of God like it's some kind of buffet table. You know, like we're, we're going, anybody ever been on a cruise? Yeah, yeah I know you yeah, have, yeah, like a lot of them. So I've never been on a cruise, but what I hear is there's lots of food. And and you go you go down now you can't eat every now I have been I have been at church dinner on the grounds as we call them or potlucks right okay you can't put everything on your plate and so you go and and you get a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this and, and we treat we treat the gifts of God the same way like God just put it out on a buffet table and we just get to pick whatever we want and what we're comfortable with and what we like the taste of or, or whatever. But God's given these gifts for all of us to use and for all of us to embrace. And he's given them for the benefit of you and he's given them for the benefit of the body of Christ and he's been given them to us for the benefit of evangelizing the world. No calories. And no calories. <laughs> so instead of trying to make a list of all the reasons why the gift isn't for you, why not just embrace what God has given you?